Hello everybody, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Reform GGA, and I'm here to do a follow-up video on the video that I just posted, which was an analysis of different calibers. And of course, this is a part of our ongoing discussion on double action, single action auto loaders. And of course, one of the questions that's going to come up is, which caliber should I choose? And so the point of putting out that study was to provide a, a lot of information so that people could make an informed decision about it. Uh, however, that video got fairly long. It's like over two hours. And I do realize that a lot of people out there just simply don't want to wade through all of the, uh, that information. And so what I'm going to do in this video is just a very brief breakdown of the results. And here goes. In the analysis that I provided, I talked about several different calibers. Uh, what I would consider to be mouse gun calibers like 25 ACP, 22 LR, and 32 ACP. I would call those mouse gun calibers. And then there are uh, not mouse gun calibers, but also not full service calibers, or at least not considered service calibers anymore. Uh, we'll call them maybe intermediate calibers, like the 380 ACP and the 38 Special. And then there are, of course, the service calibers, meaning 9mm, 45 ACP, and 40 Smith & Wesson. And then there are calibers out there that, in terms of ballistic power at least, were beyond the typical service calibers, like 357 Magnum and 44 Magnum. Those were the main handgun calibers that I examined. And what I said in the video is basically that the mouse gun calibers, the little 25s, 32s, and the 22s, are really not your best bet. Uh, oftentimes, statistically speaking, in real world scenarios, they do give people an advantage you know, over not having something. You know, it's, it's better than a sharp stick, it's better than trying to use your fists, but their success rate, their overall success rates at being able to stop an assailant from doing whatever it is they intend to do to you is usually somewhere only in the 60 to 70 percent range. So if you choose one of those guns for yourself, that means that you're leaving at least a 30 percent chance that, you know, this person that you're intending to defend yourself from is in fact going to be do, able to do whatever it is they intended to do. That's a pretty big window of opportunity. So the mouse gun calibers, not really preferable. And this is one of the things that I was going with in that video is that the overall effect in the end is what we should measure by. The best caliber is the one that actually works in real world scenarios the best. And the mouse gun calibers, while they can have several advantages and be very easy to carry around because they're small and all those kinds of things, they just, in real world situations, don't tend to work out as often as uh, other calibers do. And then, like I said, there were the intermediate calibers like 380 ACP and 38 Special. Their success rates taken as a whole as to whether or not they kept the bad person from doing the bad thing, uh, their success rate was considerably higher, uh, low, 30, uh, low 80s, I should say, in terms of percentage. Uh, one was 84 and the other one was 83, so pretty much neck and neck in terms of how effective they are in real world scenarios. 83% um, of the time or 84% of the time, using one of those kinds of guns to defend yourself will work out successfully. and so. Uh, is a significant step up from the mouse gun calibers, meaning that you have now a less than 20% opportunity for someone to do something bad. That's a good improvement. Um, and then going up from there, you have the service calibers, the 9mm 45 ACP and the 40 Smith and Wesson. And they're even a, a step up from the, the intermediate calibers when it comes to real world situations of being able to defend yourself, how often they were able to successfully defend themselves in real world situations from hard data that we have uh, turned out to be uh, 86 or 87 percent. Uh, depending on which specific one of those that you're looking at, but 
the data is such that you know one percent difference here and there isn't really all that is significant so it doesn't matter which one's which but they all performed in the real world about the same that doesn't mean that ballistically they're the same they're not um, but in terms of overall effect when everything was said and done if you use this gun you know, a gun of this caliber to protect yourself what are your odds of coming out of the uh, encounter uh, successfully with all three of those calibers it's 86 or 87 percent that's pretty good and then you get into the calibers that are more powerful than service calibers like the 357 magnum and the uh, 44 magnum and their success rate was decently high um, either like 91 percent effect uh, overall effectiveness for the 357 or like an 87 or 88 percent effectiveness for the 44 magnum so that's good um, and so those those are all viable uh, and then the question comes down to okay so which one's the best the mouse guns like I said out of the gate were pretty much not on the table just because 60 to 70 percent overall success rate isn't so good but everything past that once you get past 32 ACP in terms of kinetic energy um, all of them will get you at least into the 80s perhaps with the 357 into the low 90s and that is really great so all of those are very much so viable in that sense but then you can start looking at other uh, questions you know we definitely want something to be successful in the real world and basically everything from 380 ACP all the way up to 44 Magnum will get you those kinds of numbers in terms of what we have available to us as data right now and what I'm referring primarily to is the Greg Ellerfritz real world study where he studied 1,785 real world cases uh, the vast majority of which involved handguns and he broke it down by caliber and all those kinds of things and said how does this actually work and those are the numbers that he came up with as far as how many times it did or did not work in each case all that kind of stuff um, but beyond just whether or not it worked you're also going to have to consider who is it that's behind the trigger and those beyond uh, service caliber guns why they can be very effective for certain people they are not something that I could consciously recommend to a lot of people because 357 and 44 Magnum can be unwieldy guns for some people you know a 357 in an airweight J frame revolver yeah, it's not exactly a very pleasant gun to shoot and 44 Magnum is usually not an overly pleasant gun to shoot either and there's a lot of people that just simply are not competent uh, with those kinds of guns uh, guns that have quite a bit of recoil quite a bit of kick can take a, a fair amount of skill to use and there's a lot of people that just simply are not going to be able to master those kinds of guns under their ordinary life conditions that is a lot of people that would have guns for self-defense purposes don't train all the time and that's one of the realities they have to take into account they're not out doing drills all the time and moving and and doing all kinds of tactical exercises with their gun the average person simply isn't the average person who's worried about self-defense goes out they get a gun they might attend a class or two and then that's pretty much it for a lot of people and a lot of them don't go out shooting any more than say three times a year uh, there's a lot of people that are kind of at the low end of the spectrum as far as training and maintaining their skill is concerned and for those kind of people those beyond service caliber uh, type guns the 357 magnums the 44 magnums is probably going to be a bit too much for them to handle so I wouldn't necessarily suggest those in those cases where they've been used they have been used pretty successfully but you also have to look at how many cases those involved and it was relatively few cases together both of them made up less than 10 percent of the overall study that Greg Ellefitz did uh, meaning that there is definitely a deselection bias going on there there's lots of people who preferred not to use a 357 or a 44 Magnum and a lot of it has to you know, has to do with just how people feel about their competency with the gun do I feel like this is actually going to work for me and for a lot of people they didn't um, and so just because of how powerful they can be I wouldn't suggest them for the average person who's concerned about self-defense that doesn't mean that some people can't use them and use them very well 
if you are a person who's competent with those kinds of guns, then by all means. Okay, if you are sufficiently accurate with them under stress and you've uh, done a decent amount of self-defense training with them and you regularly practice with them with full power loads that you would plan on using in self-defense, great. Uh, but most people just simply aren't there. And because of that, I didn't call them the best. Not to say that they're not ballistically capable, but I'm saying when you factor in the human element into it as to what people are going to be competent with, then they're not so great. And like I said, the mouse calibers, the mouse gun calibers, they're kind of already out. And so the only two categories that are left are the intermediate calibers, like 380 ACP and 38 Special, and then also the actual service calibers, like 9mm, 45, uh, 45, and 40 Smith & Wesson. And the interesting thing between those two is um, the lethality of the guns. That is, the way that people use guns in each of these categories tends to be really different. With a 380 or a 38 Special, these are guns that are usually relatively small, they don't usually have overly great sights, and they usually don't have a very high round capacity. Uh, 380s will sometimes have six rounds, seven rounds, eight rounds, in rare cases nine rounds, but not above that. And a 38 Special Revolver usually does not have a capacity of more than five or six rounds. There are some guns out there that can thir shoot 38 Special that will say have seven round uh, cylinders in them, things like that, but that's relatively rare. Most of the time for self-defense guns, if you're talking about 38 Special, it's gonna be in a revolver rather than an auto loader, and you're only talking about uh, five, maybe six rounds that the person is gonna have available to them. And for certain people, that, that low round count with both the 380 ACP and the 38 Special can work, uh, particularly with people that are very uh, well trained with them. When I think of people who are well trained with revolvers, one of the people that comes to mind is Paul Harrell. He does a lot of YouTube videos, lots of good information, and he's a real big fan of revolvers and considers them to be very viable self-defense guns. And in his particular case, and in the case of people who are like him, I don't have any doubt that these guns can be very viable self-defense guns. And he's proven that with the right combination of shooter and gun and ammo, you can actually get some really impressive accuracy out of them as well. He's been able to hit targets beyond 50 yards with his little 38 uh, special snub nose revolvers, which is something that personally I certainly could not do. And in his case, I think, you know, he has He's cool-headed enough, and he's proven, certainly has proven that he's cool-headed enough because he has been in fairly dangerous situations, life-threatening situations, come out on top. He can stay cool under pressure, get the rounds off that he needs to, be sufficiently accurate, etc., etc. So for him, a low round, uh, lap, low round count gun like a 380 ACP or a 38 Special, I think are very viable for people who are like that. Again, people who have a high level of training, who can deal with stressful situations very well, um, can really make use of a low round count gun. But other people that don't have as much training, who aren't used to dealing with stress while they're shooting and those kinds of things, they, statistically speaking, usually don't work out the same way that highly trained people do. Highly trained people with guns are going to be able to operate those guns at greater distances. Like I said, Paul Harrell can hit a target at 50 yards with a snub nose revolver, which is awesome. I certainly can't do that, and a vast majority of people that I know who simply own guns for self-defense, I wouldn't call them avid shooters by any means, but they do own guns for self-defense, they certainly cannot do that. And in those cases, you're either going to have people who miss a lot, which means that you're stuck with the prospect of potentially having to reload, and reload costs you time, and self-defense encounters don't involve a lot of time to begin with. A lot of self-defense encounters from the time that you start shooting back to the time that the uh, encounter is over is usually no more than seven seconds. They're fairly quick. And if you have to take a few seconds out, and it might be just literally just a few seconds, just three seconds or uh, two seconds, usually no more than that, but if you have to take a couple of seconds out to reload, that is a couple of seconds 
where you're going to be very vulnerable and something really bad can happen to you. And hopefully you have the wherewithal to think, you know, whether or not this is a good time to reload or not and all those kinds of things. But if you run out of rounds, you run out of rounds and you're kind of stuck having to reload. Um, but it's just really not something that people want to to do. And so either I'm going to be able to engage as soon as possible, regardless of how far away the attacker is, or what a lot of people wind up doing is they wind up, because they don't want to run out of rounds, they wind up letting the, uh, the attacker get fairly close. And in those cases, um, there it's kind of hit or miss. Uh, you've let the attacker get fairly close because you're afraid of running out of rounds, and the option is either that you're, because you're flustered, because the action is moved that much closer to you, and you wind up just completely missing, which will uh, ruin your overall effectiveness. Um, these intermediate calibers, the, the 380 ACP and the 38 Special, are usually not quite as effective as the true service calibers are. Still more than 80% effective, but still less than the service calibers. Um, and part of it is just because people are using them differently. They trying to conserve that ammo. They let the action get that much closer to them. They get flustered and so uh, their hits are not uh, sometimes going to be as effective. Or you could have kind of the opposite thing is where people have gotten real close in and they pull their gun to defend themselves and they wind up making shots that in a certain sense are maybe a little too accurate. Um, taking a point blank shot from a gun is of course uh, something that's very potentially deadly and if you're intending to stop a threat there's a very high likelihood that you're going to aim in a spot that you know is vital if you know what I mean and if you aim in that particular spot yeah there's a real good chance you're going to end the fight but there's also a real good chance that you are going to kill the person that you're dealing with and with these uh, real small guns like a typical 30 uh, sorry 380 ACP or a typical 38 special you see those kinds of shots more often they've those uh, the people who are defending themselves with those guns have let the target get closer and they're aiming for a certain part of the target and what that means is that in the cases where they are able to connect, they do connect with something vital more often, which means they tend to be more lethal for the person that you're defending against. And some people, they don't care about that at all. But me, I'm a Reformed Christian. We value human life. We obviously uh, believe in the right to self-defense and those kinds of things. But the fact that these guns are more likely to wind up in a dead assailant is something that gives us pause. Uh, whereas you compare that with the service calibers, the service calibers are guns that usually have better sights on them, they usually have a higher round capacity, uh, they're usually more comfortable, you, they can be shot at greater distances with more ease and more comfort and more competency. And so when people use service caliber guns, they'll typically engage much sooner. And that actually gives the person that they're defending themselves from a little bit of pause. Um, that is, they'll usually see the gun coming uh, more quickly because it enters the fight at a, at a sooner point. And they can maybe decide that they would not be best served by continuing their present course of action. And that's one of the things that leads to the success of the service calibers. They get drawn quicker and it causes a change in the other person's behavior quicker. Um, and then since people are willing to use them at those greater distances, um, you can get shots on target, but they're usually not going to be quite as accurate because you're usually engaging at a farther distance. And so you can get shots on target that will incapacitate someone. People don't like being shot, even if it's not a vital shot, it'll incapacitate them in the sense that they're, they're done fighting. That's what I mean by incapacitation. They decide to stop. Um, voluntary incapacitation counts in, in what I'm talking about. It's still a success from the defender's point of view. If the person decides that they don't want to fight anymore, that's still a success for you. And with the, with the service calibers, like I said, the shots are taken at a little bit greater range. They're not aimed as precisely. 
there's a much better chance that the person is going to survive getting hit by them at those kinds of distances. It doesn't mean that they're ballistically inferior. It just means that when you're operating at those distances versus the distances that people operate when they have guns with fewer rounds in them, like the 380 ACPs and the 38 Specials, um, when the people use those intermediate guns, like the 380 ACPs and the 38 Specials, a lot higher chance that they're going to put the round in a very particular place on the target, and it's going to be lethal. Now, if you're operating at a greater distance, you're going to aim for the bigger part of the target, and it's less likely to kill. Even if the round that they're using is more powerful, because 9mm, 45, 40 uh, Smith & Wesson, those are all more powerful in terms of raw ballistics than 380 ACP or 38 Special. But in real world scenarios, because of the differences in distances at which they're used, those service calibers actually wind up being safer for the assailant and they also wind up being more effective for the defender because you're keeping the threat at a greater distance and you're willing to engage at a greater distance and you're willing to spend more rounds keeping that threat away from you because the gun holds more rounds. And so the net results of everything in the study that I looked at was that the service calibers are the ones that are going to be best for you. The beyond service calibers in terms of power usually shot out of right, uh, revolvers. Revolvers don't, revolvers don't have a lot of rounds. And when people don't have a lot of rounds, they tend to try to conserve ammo. And that can result in greater lethality for the assailants. And that happens with both the really big, powerful calibers and also happens with the really small ones. The little mouse guns, they also usually don't hold a lot of rounds, aren't very powerful. People tend to kind of conserve ammo with them. Same thing like I was talking about with the 380 ACP and the 38 Special. People are not engaging as quickly with them, which means that the engagement happens that much closer, and the closer the engagement happens, the more likely somebody is to die. The service calibers, though, because they usually have better sights, because they have more rains, uh, uh, sorry, more rounds in them, they carry uh, more bullets usually, and they're more comfortable to actually shoot, they typically are brought into the fight much sooner, and it keeps the threat away from you, which works out good for you, and because you're keeping the threat away from you, it actually makes it less likely that the other person is going to die too. And for like I said, for myself as a Reformed Christian, we do value the Imago Dei, the image of God in people. We believe that human life has an innate value to it because it is made in the Imago Dei. And because of that, that is something that is going to factor into our thinking. Yes, we are willing to defend ourselves. That is something that is given to us, biblically speaking, as biblical Christians. But we still have a responsibility to think in terms of the value of the Imago Dei. And if I use one of these small guns with very few rounds, or just maybe a big gun with very few rounds, like a lot of 44 Magnums are, they're fairly big, but they still only hold, you know, five, six, maybe seven rounds. I haven't seen too many like that, but typical revolver uh, size. If I have my, my druthers, I'm going to have something that I'm going to be willing to engage with at a greater distance. A lot of that depends on the individual shooter. You know, there are some people with those smaller guns with fewer rounds that will be perfectly willing to engage at a greater distance. Like I said, Paul Harrell, for example, if you can make good solid shots at 50 yards with a snub nose revolver, go for it. If that works for you, fantastic. But my concern is that the average person, statistically speaking, if they have a gun that they know is either low power or has a low round count, they're going to tend to conserve which means that they're going to tend to let the threat get closer to them, which increases the likelihood that someone, either them or the other guy, is going to die. Keeping yourself away from the threat is what tends to work out best for both you and the assailant. And the service calibers are the category of guns, uh, calibers that do that the best. 9mm, 45 and of course 40. If you can get a gun in that caliber that is something that you can reasonably conceal carry. Conceal carry is going to be uncomfortable because you're wearing something that you're not used to wearing. After a while it kind of you get used to it but you have to stick with it for a while. 
and you also sometimes have to kind of fiddle around with different concealed carry techniques to find something that's reasonably comfortable. Nothing's going to be perfectly comfortable, just like wearing glasses, for example. These things are not overly comfortable. Glasses are not an innately comfortable thing to wear, but I need them to see, and so I've gotten used to it. They're still not overly comfortable. And they're not great, and they have disadvantages, but I need them to see, and so they, they stay here. Same kind of idea with concealed carry guns. There's no such thing as a perfectly ideal concealed carry gun that you can carry on you, and it's just going to disappear. You're not going to feel it at all. Not really true. But if you can get a 9mm, 45, or 40 ACP gun that can be carried reasonably, a lot of times it'll take an adjustment period. You'll have to get used to it, just like you have to get used to wearing glasses. You'll have to get used to it. But if you can do that with those calibers, you're going to be better served. They're guns that usually have better sights. They hold more rounds. They're more comfortable to shoot. It's going to make you willing to engage at a greater distance. And the greater distance that you can keep between you and your assailant, the better. The other guns that have either lower round counts or less powerful, people don't tend to be willing to engage, uh, engage as quickly with those, and the result is a worse outcome statistically for you and for the other guy. Okay. But if I can defend myself while minimizing the risk of killing the other guy, that's what I'm going to do. And that's why I recommend the service calibers. Okay. They're powerful maybe not overly powerful so as to be prohibitive, like in certain cases a 357 Magnum or 44 Magnum can be. They're also not so small that they just simply can't get the job done a lot of times, like the 25 ACP, the 32 ACP, and the 22 LR. And like I said, they usually operate at a much better distance than either a 380 ACP or a 38 Special. Okay. So that was the study. That was the results that I came to. Um, and hopefully when you guys hear that explanation, you get at what I'm, I'm trying to say here. I'm not trying to say that 9mm, 45, and 40 Smith & Wesson are all ballistically uh, equal to each other. They're not. Okay. A 45 is capable of more muzzle energy than either the 40 Smith & Wesson or the 9mm. On average, though, 40 Smith & Wesson actually tends to be loaded a little bit hotter than your average 45 load is, though. And the 9mm is definitely not, it doesn't, and it definitely does not have the kinetic energy of the other two. And of course, the bullet sizes are different and all those kinds of things. But in terms of the success that they give you relative to uh, preserving the life of the other person as much as possible, the service cal uh, calibers are usually the best balance on that. They have the best ch uh, chance of incapacitating the other person while minimizing the risk that the other person is going to die. Now, of course, if you shoot at someone, you're not helping them live. This is true. But they're the ones that are the least likely to be lethal um, given that you've incapacitated them. And that especially from a Reformed Christian point of view, is what you want. Okay, now, like I said, they're not equal to each other in ballistics. They're not equal to the other guns, uh, calibers uh, that are, uh, that they're not equal to the other calibers that were under consideration. Their 357 Magnum and 44 Magnum are a lot more powerful, um, just in terms of raw ballistics. But as far as getting the intended outcome, you are safe, and the other person is not dead, the service calibers are the best balance. All right, so that was the summary. If you guys want to see what that looked like in more details and go through all the specific data and where all it comes from and a lot of resources that I talked about and all that, go ahead and look at the longer one. Like I said, it's over two hours. I get into a lot of detail. Uh, but the short of it is that you should stay away from the mouse gun calibers, like 25, 32, and 22 LR, and Probably not going to be overly well served by something that has a low round count, like the 380 ACP, the 38 Special, or even the 357 Magnum and the 44 Magnum. Most people are going to be best served with a service caliber gun. They hold a decent number of rounds. People are more willing to engage with them at distance. The sights are usually better, etc., etc. Okay, stay away from the mouse gun calibers, and if you can, get an actual service caliber gun. That's my piece. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. Bye-bye.